So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday service here at Namaste Lake Chapala. So wonderful to join with you on this very important day to me, maybe to you as well, the feast day of St. Francis. I know there are churches all over that are blessing the animals or praying the prayer of St. Francis, which we just heard a, a moment ago. And to remember a man who 800 years ago did something that was so radical, so revolutionary that it changed the world. And yet what Francis attempted to do that did change everything was so simple and so obvious. It's amazing that it had not been tried before or that we have not been trying to do it in our own way. What Francis did or what he tried to do was to simply see if it was possible to do what Jesus said to really live it, not just talk about it, but to become the actual vibration of the teachings of love that comes from the Christ, which is everywhere all at once. My favorite current Franciscan, Father Richard Rohr, likes to say that the Christ is just another word for everything. And that certainly is how St. Francis felt. He saw the Christ, he saw the beloved everywhere in the creatures that he saw around him in the forest, in the people that he saw in the towns and in the cities that he visited, no matter what. Those three words which we focus on so often, no matter what, he chose to see through the eyes of Christ. He chose to see everyone, the high, the low, the poor, the rich, everyone as God or as Christ would see them. And it reminds me that last night I had an interesting experience that I wanted to share with all of you. I started, you know, going down the old YouTube rabbit hole, which I try not to do here in my anchor hole, but every once in a while it gets the best of me. But I came across several videos that really affected me. And it, it taught me a lot about what Francis did 800 years ago and what we're called to do today. I came across a series of videos for a pair of glasses, but these are very special glasses. They're made for people who are colorblind. Maybe you've seen some of these videos before. They look like ordinary sunglasses, and yet when you put them on, if for your whole life you could see no color, just black and white and gray, suddenly, the instant you put these glasses on, you see how vibrant and how colorful the world is all around you. And there are many videos of, of people giving their loved ones this gift, older men and women and children, and every single one of them, the exact same thing would happen. They would say, oh, this is nice. Oh, really? This is going to help me? Okay, let me, let me see. And they would put the glasses on and instantly break down weeping. Because they didn't realize how beautiful it was. They had never seen color before. They had no idea just how colorful and vibrant the world is all around us. And it was so touching. I found myself there in my little tiny bedroom just crying as I went through video after video of this and seeing these, these strong men, some of whom would say, oh, I've seen some of these videos and I'm, a, I'm not going to get emotional. And then they would put the glasses on and just break down. And that's what we're called to do, to break down, to realize through the vision of grace, of the Christ, of holiness, whatever words you want to use, to put on those glasses and to see the vibrant universe, the heaven that has always been around us, literally to see the colors and the vibrancy of heaven. And when you put on those glasses, which are the same glasses that Francis himself put on, everything will change. But here, here's the thing, in order to see those colors, you have to be willing 
to give up everything that you once thought was so important, everything you clinged to, or is it clung to, everything you clung to in separation, everything that you thought, oh, I can't live without this, I, I have to have my computer, I have to have whatever it is we think we have to have, has blocked us from realizing the only thing that we've always had. But it's only when we are willing to give up everything that everything comes to us that this vision finally appears, the vibrancy that's always been around us. And so just as Francis, 800 years ago, became the lens through which the people of his time could suddenly see the colors of heaven, so are you called to be the, that lens today. You first have to choose to put on those glasses yourself, of course. You first have to choose to be witness to the glory and the vibrancy that's all around you, to literally see heaven everywhere. And then you'll be able to guide others, not through words, not through any theological argument. Those things are nothing compared to the real witness the energy, the love, the presence that allows us to open our eyes and finally see. This is what Francis did 800 years ago. And this is why we still talk about him today. Whether you're Christian or Muslim or Jewish, so many people of almost every faith have always looked at Francis, even if it was only Francis of the birdbath. The Francis that we just think of as being one with nature. That is a beautiful image, but he was so much more than that. And when we think of him in the way that we're describing today, as the lens through which people could see the vibrancy of heaven that's all around us every moment, this is when we begin to see the true value, the true importance, and the true blessedness of Francis. And then to know, just as he initiated a new renaissance in his time, so are we called to initiate a renaissance, a renaissance in our time by being the source of this new vision. You know, Francis is so often given credit for seeing uh, nature and the animals and the birds as holy, that we don't really understand that it wasn't that he was oh, just looking at nature in that way. He was looking at everything in that way. He saw the face of Christ in everything and in everyone in all of the creatures. And it was shortly before his death that Francis wrote what we'll call the real prayer of St. Francis. The beautiful prayer that you heard at the beginning of the service, which was me and my friend Tina Malia singing my version, is always called the prayer of St. Francis, but no one knows who wrote that. Certainly it was not Francis himself. But Francis did write one of the most beautiful and important prayers. In fact, the very first piece of literature that was ever written and published in the language that we now know as Italian. That was the, what we call the Canticle of the Creatures. Francis wrote it shortly before his death as he was beginning to fade himself and he began to look around and to realize all the creatures, brother sun, sister moon, brother fire, sister air, all of the creatures and the expressions of divinity as just that expressions of divinity. And so he wrote down this, this little prayer. He was very near Claire when he wrote that. He was in a little hut right by San Damiano. And it's interesting that last night on what we call the transitus of St. Francis, that it was a full moon. Claire is often called Sister Moon. And Claire was right there when he wrote the prayer and she was also right there when he passed. And so last night, Sister Moon was looking down upon all of us in all of her fullness, just as she was when only a few weeks or maybe a few months after Francis wrote that prayer. He lay in a little hut right next to their little friary called St. Mary the Angels on the plain below Assisi. And he asked two of his brothers to come in and to sing that prayer to him. This was the last thing he wanted to hear. He wanted to hear and to feel 
all the different creatures, all the different elements praising God as he was about to praise God in a very new and beautiful way through what he called Sister Death. So I thought what we would do is put ourselves in that scene. I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. And I want you to imagine that you're sitting there in that little hut at St. Mary the Angels. And there are only a few people there. Claire is there. Bernardo, the first brother to leave everything, to come and live with Francis, and a couple of the other brothers that he has known and loved. And he calls these two brothers to sing this prayer one last time to allow him, as Sister Death approaches, to allow him to praise God through all of these creatures of God. So imagine that you are there in that hut. You're looking down upon the tiny body of Francesco Benedone as these two friars begin to sing. Most high, all powerful, good Lord, my own. belong to you beloved alone and first my lord his brother's son who brings the day and sends the light how radiant in his splendor All praise to you through Sister Moon and all your stars so fair. She reflects the light that you offer her and then returns to your sacred care. And as for Brother Wind, Sister Air, you cherish what you have made. The love you share is all we need. So renew our hearts, we pray. Renew our hearts. Your holy love 
reflects your holy love and your grace. And as for Mother Earth, who sustains us and provides for all we need, all her fruits and colored flowers, a great harvest that we'll feed. Renew our hearts, for we are waiting, and your blessings are true. Each one of them you are creating reflects the light that is found only in you. Most high, all powerful, good Lord, my own. I am home. I am home. So, today, we're called to praise all the creatures and every aspect of the divine which we see every moment, and in doing so, to become that lens, to become that lens through which the vibrancy of heaven can be seen and witnessed and loved and adored. I'm going to turn it over to another great love of Francis Sinclair, great lover of Francis Sinclair, and that's our dear sister Vicki, and let her bring this right back to the practical. Good morning, Vicki. Good morning, James. Thank you. And thank you for the other night. Um, sharing that, that Camino you did across America was really, it just filled everyone's heart, mine especially. But, um, you know, you said it right in the beginning. We have to have that vision and stay with it. It's not just simply about being single-minded with spirit within. And that's the traditional mystic's stance to keep that focus on spirit within. Unless we see it in our brother, it hasn't integrated. Yes. We have to see it in our brother. And when we do, it's like what Christina said, how the crow falls off the eagle's back. That's the ascending heights where the negativities and the fears and the delusions that we've been under fall away. We don't have to fight dragons and windmills. We don't have to figure anything out. We need to ascend to the Christ in our brother as our as ourself and collectively as souls in time very practically coming into this time of holy oneness where the traditions of the standard the old churches are falling away they're just kind of just kind of fading away because the experiences of so many souls in every tradition, no tradition, non-tradition, are coming to this experience of our oneness, that we belong as one. Even having a pandemic, that is one. It affects the whole, we are one in it. So this experience of oneness is coming through what appears as a darkness into the holiest of spots where we do only see only the light in one another. But this lens of oneness is that when we let, a, let our blinders come off and let it just rest on the light in our brother, it does make us weep. And I, I'm saying that practically, even, you know, you guys know Big Teddy. We've been divorced for 10 years and now he shows up and here he is. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved him. You know that. It's not that I didn't, but seeing the tenderness in him with eyes that see differently now as well and appreciating it does make me literally weep at the beauty of my brother and in all the things I would have 
you know, judged or condemned. I see them so differently. I just understand how it's just everyone doing their best, everyone, and nothing, no one is against anyone. Everyone is within themselves trying to let whatever the dark thoughts are, the guilt, the hidden stuff, rise and fall away. Everyone from, you know, from saint to sinner, it's the same. <laughs> and I, I think even seeing um, our beloved president in this latest experience has brought a sense of compassion to, through many people that wouldn't have had that. Mm -hmm. And compassion is the first lens that starts to clear if we're going to see only the light in one another and then the other place this is showing up like this has been a dark age of of self you know the me generation and self and the renaissance this time is called the second coming this is the coming of the realization of christ as our only identity or as divinity as our only identity not even to limit it to the word Christ. And as that comes, look around. You're living in one of the finest, most, most precious examples of brotherhood. In, in Francis's time, he had 5,000 brothers flock to be friars within a few years. And in our time now, we're not called to go live in, in old-fashioned monastic settings. But here you are living in a monastic setting that has a different definition it rests on brotherhood and on the light in one another as the foundation it rests on grace not on liberty and license and all the rest of it it doesn't rest on lots of rules that <clears throat> we set up for structural um maintenance it rests on grace and we're being called into all of these ways of joining just like being here on zoom we have a Zoom family, <laughs> everyone on this call. <laughs> How many of us have been here since the first day? Many, I think. And we all know it. Like, we, I was called. I, you, you, I never had a conversation with you. I just heard you were doing this. It came out in an email. And I had the call. I had to come. It wasn't a choice. It was a natural next breath. And that's the kind of living. We're coming into new ways of living together, socially, in community, that looks different than it looked. Even 25 years ago when we were at the academy and living in our communes or all kinds of different situations where people tried and did live wonderfully together, we're called to different ways even from that and we don't know what it's going to look like except that today we live in one family right here today, right now in this Zoom call. We have one heart and one mind. And Francis demonstrates that. He demonstrated 800 years ago and he's still a beacon of, of example and experience for us now. So I'm grateful for how this is unfolding. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Hey, Vicki, by the way, I just want you to know that several other people have been writing about this, but I don't know if you can see it, but Brother Sun is shining down upon you in the most beautiful <laughs> way. The oh. rays of the sun are coming through your sunroof and just, oh my gosh, it's beautiful. And by the way, something else that, to just to piggyback onto what you said, that yes, we are called not to live this just in monasteries or convents, but to live this in our ordinary lives. And something I didn't even know until a few days ago, that by the time of Francis's death, one third of Europe were Franciscan. Do you know that? A third of the entire population of Europe. Wow. No, the vast majority were people just like us in the third order. The third order had the third order. For those of you who don't know, are people, which what Vicky was talking about, people who are living this in their ordinary lives. They they don't have to be celibate or live in a monastery. They live in their own homes and they express this in their in their own way. And a third of Europe were so on fire that they had put on those glasses and were just overwhelmed by the colors that they never knew were all around them. So, yes, thank you, Vicki. Teddy, what would you like to share? You know, Jimmy, there's something in the course that I know is true, and Francis knew it was true before the course came out, and that was protect everything you value by the act of giving it away, and more will be given to you. And all I know is I've been called out a couple of times to do that, and why we didn't have like Fran that many Franciscans. We had academies all around the world. 
And it wouldn't have been possible unless, you know, I got the call from Jesus and I was willing to do what he asked. You know, a friend of ours, Helen Kennedy, recently passed away. Oh, and I, I remember, and, and, and Helen and, and Glad Hancock and I, we traveled around the world, man, do, doing everything, starting places, meeting with people. And, you know, it was all because Glad and Helen were willing to give it all away and help me do what I was given to do. And even that I was called to give away too, give all the academy away and start to print the course and give it away. So all I know is when you talk about Francis, Francis knew exactly what Jesus wanted him to do. Protect everything you value by the act of giving it away and more will be given to you. Isn't that just the most beautiful thing ever? Protect everything of value that you have by giving it away. And you're right, Francis was the full embodiment of it. He gave it all away, literally, and became the poorest of the poor. But look what was given back to him. Wow. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you, Vicky. What a beautiful way to celebrate St. Francis.